name of Jesus. Let's go ahead and go into the word of the Lord. In Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 41. Please let me also say this. The, uh, the Bethesda challenge is not over. I want you to continue to give as we have been normally giving. And I don't want you to go back. When you, God teaches you something, you never want to go back to what you used to do. Amen? Never want to do that. That's, that's regressing. Amen? That's not progressing. That's regressing. And the Bible called it backsliding. Huh. Amen. So once we learn how to give, how the Bible tells us we ought to give, then we want to stick with that because that's how you're going to be blessed. Anybody believe that? Amen. I, it's, I find it quite uh, interesting how people will try to prove God wrong, but I think in the last three months we have proved God to be absolutely correct. And God is not a liar. And, and you can try to do something else. I mean, this is America. You're the home of the free and the land of the brave and all that wonderful stuff. But I can tell you this, it don't work in the kingdom of God. Amen? Just got to gotta do what God wants us to do. That's just the, that's just the, the, the tall and strong, skinny of it. We just got to do what God wants us to do. And I stay right here for a second. I just feel I need to stay right here. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. No matter whether I'm talking about giving or talking about how we ought to uh, conduct ourselves as Christians, uh, this 19, 2016 type of Christianity where I'm just going to make it up as I go along won't get you into the kingdom. And a lot of people are trying to do that. They're trying, well, God wants me to, God said my ways are not your ways. So unless you're getting your ways and your, your conduct from the word of God, then I can guarantee you, you're absolutely missing the mark. But if you go back into the word of God and do as God tells you to do, 100% of the time, you'll be right. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we don't need to reinvent this thing. This thing has been around for 2,000 years. You just got here. So let's just fall in line with what the God is telling us to do, and we'll make heaven our home. Amen. That was uh, the first part of uh, a sermon. Amen. Luke chapter 19, verse 41. And when he was come near, he beheld the city, and that's Jerusalem, and wept over it, saying, If thou hast known even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. For the day shall come upon thee, that thy enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee round, and keep thee on every side, and lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee. And they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and Savior Jesus Christ, again, we thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for allowing us to be here, oh God, in the house of God. God, to lift up and, oh God, exalt your holy name. I pray right now in the name of Jesus as we come to this part of the service, oh God, to hear your word, oh God. I pray our hearts will be open, our ears will be attentive, oh God, to what thus saith the Lord. I pray, oh God, that we'll be like the man that built the house on a solid foundation, oh God. We'll not only be hearers, but we'll be doers also, O God. Touch us, I pray. Bless us, I pray, O God. We take authority and dominion over this atmosphere right now, God. We bind everything that's not like you, O God. And we ask you to have your way, we pray. Save the lost today, Lord God. Someone that do not know you in the pardon of their sins, O God. God, someone that will repent of their sins. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. And you will fill them with the gift of the Holy Ghost. Get the honor, get the glory, get the praise. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone say amen. Amen. You may be seated in Jesus' name. And for a topic tonight today will simply be this, the season of your visitation. The season of your visitation. We find that in our life, in the world that we live in, in the world that God created us in, that he created a thing, an element called time. And because there is time, we realize that we are not eternal. We are finite. Because time is a measurement. It has a beginning and it has an end. And we 
are allowed to live within a certain amount of time. Whether we are going to be living for 100 years, 50 years, 70 or 80, we will have a beginning and we will have an end. And we must understand that in that time frame, we have a choice. We have a choice of what we're going to do with that time. The one thing about the element of time is that time is not redeemable. You can't get it back. Once it's gone, it's gone forever. We can't get yesterday back. Yesterday is gone into eternity past. We can't redeem it. We can't capture it. It's gone. And so all of us are living one day closer to the end of our time. I know we don't like to think about it, but it is our reality. More so when you get older and get to a certain plateau of age or a certain level, your body begins to tell you the time is winding up. Because your body can't do what it used to do. Amen. All the old folks say amen. The young folks say, ah, Pastor, I'm not sure. Well, I'll tell you like this, young buck. <laughs> Just live a little longer. And parts of your body will start to hurt that you didn't even know existed. You used to slam dunk from the free throw line. Now you're just trying to do set shots. It all comes because of time. We start seeing our body decay. We see our vision go blurry. We see our hair recede and our turn a different color than what it was once was. We start going to the doctor more frequently, asking the doctor what's going on. And he's telling us things that we only thought was reserved for our parents and our grandparents. Help us, God. And we must understand that we live within this time frame. In Genesis 1, verse 14, we find God instituting this time. We find in verse 14 of Genesis chapter 1, he says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons, and for days, and for years. And so God institutes this time frame. He puts the sun for the day and the moon for the night, which tells us that each one of those periods of the day only has a certain amount of time. One will spend a certain amount of time, and then it will go down. Then the other will come from the other horizon, and it only has a certain amount of time, and it will go down. And those 24 hours will be complete after the second one has gone down. But then he says, even going further, he said there's going to be signs and seasons. Right now, we are, even though we're in Florida, we're entering into winter season. We may not see snow. We may not have uh, uh, snow angels on the ground or blizzarding uh, cold, but we do know it's a little cooler than it was in last August. And so we know that just for a brief moment, we will have a respite, if you will, from the scorching heat of the Florida weather. But God put it so because he said, I'm going to divide the time. And so you're going to know what time you're in based on the season it is in. You're going to know what time you're in based on your age. You're going to know what time you're in based on different factors that are related and are affected by time. And so we must understand that if God puts a season in the earth, if God gives us time frame, then there's a time in which God will deal with each and every one of us. And Jesus said in the, uh, Luke, the scripture we were reading, we find Jesus in one of the most saddest portions of scripture. Jesus is about to go to Calvary. And he's looking over Jerusalem one last time. And the thing that Jesus knows about Jerusalem, that Jerusalem doesn't even know, that in 38 years from that period of time, it will be a, a blaze of, of fire. That 38 years from that period of time, 
there will be a destruction of that temple. The same temple that, uh, that his, his own disciple said, Jesus, look at this, this temple. It looks so wonderful. It looks so great. And he said, no, look at that. Because some, one day there will not be a rock on top of each other. 38 years from that period of time, Titus will come in. Nero, the emperor, will uh, give a command and Jerusalem will be destroyed. And 2,000 years later, in 2016, Jerusalem still does not have a temple. And Jesus knew this. While everybody else was excited, the Lord of all creation looked at this city. The city that, they, uh, that is called the city of David. So David calls it Zion. It's a place where the presence of Almighty God resides. And the Lord of all creation wept. And that word weep there or wept, it's not just a teardrop. It is a wailing, a stomach wailing. It's like you're crying over a dead child. He's looking at this city and realizing that destruction is on the way. That the same people that are there doing their thing, some of them will be hanging from a tree. Some of them will be, be crucified. It is said by Josephus that, that, in, in, that the Roman soldiers had so many crucifixions that they ran out of trees. And here's what God was saying. He wept over it and he said, now, you would ask God, why? Why would this happen? To a city that was so loved and so glorified in the annals of the Old Testament and had kings and queens and they had the temple in the presence of God. And God said simply this, because they knew not the time of the visitation. They did not understand. He said in verse 42, if thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day the things which belong unto your peace i'll read it in a new living translation to give clarity he said how i wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace but now it is too late and peace is hidden from your eyes before long your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and closing you on every side. I dropped to the lowest part, verse 44. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. You did not recognize when God visited you. And I want to talk to you today from that same thought. You have a season of visitation. And you and I both must know what season we're in. You and I must know when God is talking to us. When when God is pulling on our heartstring. When God is dealing with your soul and dealing with your mind. Because he said it's not going to be forever. There's a time frame. There is a season. And he said you did not know the season. One of my favorite movies, if you will, is an old uh, Bible movie called Jesus of Nazareth. I used to show it when I was a little kid on NBC uh, every Sunday, uh, 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 Easter Sunday. Love that movie. It's a miniseries. It would go on Monday, Tuesday. And one of the things as I'm an adult and I, I bought the DVD, that's how much I loved it, I, I, I realized that there was a scene. And there probably was many scenes in, in, in Jesus' lifetime where Jesus goes to Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem, there's a lot of religious things happening. There's people praying in the corner. There's incense being made. There's sacrifices being brought. There's Pharisees over here, Sadducees over here. There's zealots over here. All kind of religious activity. And all of it is dedicated to Jehovah. All of it is dedicated to the Lord of hosts. And here is the Lord of hosts in human form walking by all of it. And no one knew he was there. The Bible said in John chapter 1, he came into his own 
and his own received him not. Can I tell you that just being religious will not get you into heaven? Not just going to church will get you into heaven. Now, am I saying you don't need to go to church? No, you have to go to church because the Bible says that we should not forsake the assembly of ourselves to gather as the matter of some. It is a New Testament command that we go to church. But can I tell you, you can be in church, be part of the church, and still miss God. And I'm looking at Jesus. And Jesus is walking. He's not, he's not carrying a megaphone, Brother Dwayne, and saying to people, I am Jehovah. I'm here. I'm in flesh. Don't you recognize me? He came inconspicuously. He came in a form that they wasn't ready to receive. Huh? Help us, Holy Ghost. Isn't it amazing how people will serve God, but they'll only serve God if he comes the way they want him to come. And here is Jesus. He is coming from a place they don't expect. The Bible says that when uh, Nathaniel heard about Jesus and Philip was telling him about this Jesus, he said, can any good thing come from Nazareth? That means Jesus on purpose came from a place that people thought nothing good could come from it. He came in a way that it had no glitz, had no glamour. He, he came in a way that wasn't readily accepted. And it's so amazing to me that in today's church society, God is still coming in a way they don't expect. And they say, well, that's not God. Oh, no, God couldn't come in the form of the Holy Ghost because he wouldn't expect you to speak in tongues. Oh, no, God wouldn't want you to get wet, not baptized in his name because that's not how God does. We're going to do our own thing and we're going to miss God. People want to tell God how to come. People want to tell God how to act. And people want to tell God what he will and won't do. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost that that's not the way God works. Right. So they were there and Jesus was walking by him. And, and, and he said, now, here's what's going to happen. And as he weeps, he's crying and he's wailing. And I don't know if you can imagine God wailing over something he's crying and he's, he's sad he's pouring out his soul and he said you don't understand i came to you i came to you in this form in this fashion and you rebuff me i try to tell you this and you ignored me i dealt with you in your dreams and you you put it away i dealt with you in your heart and you said no way I dealt, I brought people to you and I told you what you need to do. And you say, well, since it's not that person, it's not the prophet and it's not the apostle and it's not this person, I'm not going to receive it. And God said, you don't realize your visitation time is almost over. So friend, and I warn you today that if God is dealing with you, you need to pay attention. Can I tell you, if God is dealing in your mind and pulling on your heart and telling you to get your life together, you need not to ignore it. In Genesis chapter 6, turn there real quickly with me. This is during the time of Noah and the context is all kinds of perverseness is happening. All kind of violence is taking place. And here's God. And God says, the Lord said, my spirit shall not, shall not always. Somebody say, shall not always. What does that mean? That means God has an end to doing certain things. God is eternal, but it doesn't mean his patience is going to allow to be eternal. He will put a time limit on himself. 
because he realizes that sometimes, no matter how much he does, how much he says, people will not turn. So he said, I shall not always strive with man. That word strive is to contend. I'm always going to fight with you. I'm always going to keep telling you to do better and get better. I, if God, can I tell you something? If God is telling you something, don't doubt that you can do what he's telling you to do. If God is telling you to get your life together, that means he's one, he has the power to, get, to help you get your life together. But you got to make up in your mind, I'm going to get my life together. Too many times we're looking at ourselves and saying, well, God, I can't do it. That's why he's bothering you because he realized you can't do it. But he's telling you, you got to decide to do it. It's not going, God is a perfect gentleman. God has never once forced anyone to be saved. It's never. He doesn't force you to go to church. You know that because times you slept in. If God, can I, can I tell you something? If God wanted to force you to do something, friend, you'll be doing it. God, if God would force, God is not going to force you because, first of all, I don't even know how he, how he can do it without killing you. If, if, if I'm mad at my kid and I force them, I'm grabbing them aggressively. And I'm, if God grabs you aggressively, you die. So God doesn't force you. He gently nudges you. He puts you in situations that point towards him. He brings people around you that point towards him. But sometimes, listen, there are certain things God has put in us. And one thing he's put in us is free will. And our free will is stronger than the power that God will just demonstrate to us. So if you say, God, no, I'm not coming, there's nothing God can do. And some of us are such, my mom used to say, we're stubborn as a mule. I'm not moving. I don't care what you preach. I'm not doing it. I don't care what you say. And God is saying, how long will I have to strive with you? How long will I have to deal with you? How long will I be dealing in your mind? See, it's one thing, Brother Reggie, if it was just at church and it was just pastor that was telling you this. But when you go home and it's still ringing in your ears and God is still dealing with your heart and you read your Bible and it's still telling you the same thing. It's giving you a clue that God is trying to get your attention. And if God is trying to get your attention... You need to give God your attention. So he told the, the folks in Genesis, he said, now, I want you to pay. He said, I'm not always going to strive a man, for that man is flesh. He said, now, this, this thing right here that I made, I mean, this is like, it's like this paper towel. I mean, I can tear it up. That's nothing. He said, I'm not going to fight with, God fighting with us is like me fighting with this. It cannot withstand me. God said, I'm not going to strive with you. You realize who I am? You realize who you are? No. So he said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to shorten your days. Give you less time to mess up. He said, so man will no longer live over 120 years. That's how bad man was getting. So here God, notice what he does. I want you to pay attention. He shortens the time. Because he says, time is what's come working against you. And the longer I give you, if you don't turn, the longer you're going to be perverse. The longer you're going to be violent. But if I shorten the time, and you know you have a short time, maybe in that, in that finite period, you'll think to yourself, I'm getting too old for this foolishness. I need to turn my life around now. 
I need to get myself together. And I can tell you right now that some of us need to do that no matter how old or young you are. Because if this was the case and we were guaranteed 120 years, it would be one thing. But none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. We're much less not guaranteed two hours from now. The Bible says, I think David said it's, you know, it's by the grace of God. I'm paraphrasing that we get, a man will get, a righteous man will get three scores and ten. That means 70 years. That's a good man. Good lifetime. Now, most of us are creeping up halfway to the halfway mark. Mm -hmm. When I hit 40, I started thinking about that, that same scripture. I said I'm a little bit over the halfway mark. I need to kind of make up my mind. I need to get some things done. Just in case 70 is not the time frame I have. And I tell you, some of you are not going to make 70. Don't want to scare you, but I guess I do want to scare you. You may not. I buried more people. You know, I was thinking about it. The other day, we went to Brother Ramon's father's funeral, and he was 96 years old. And I thought to myself, this was the first old man that I buried that I went to his funeral in a long time. Majority of the funerals I've been in have been people younger than me. Most of them did not see their senior citizenship. And, I, and, and when, when I, I was talking to Brother Ramon, I said, well, bless God. It seemed like most of the people that was at the funeral was from his, his mother's side, not his father's side. And he looked at me and said, yeah, because he's outlived everybody else. Oh, help us, God. And that's a rarity. That's a rarity in, within, in, our, in, our, in our generation, in our society. Because we're so violent and we're, we're so perverse that our violence and our perversion is, is, is too much for our, our, our bodies. <laughs> oh, God, okay. Let me, let me stop right here for a second. You know, I'm not, I'm not a health nut by any stretch of the imagination. There are better people in here that have better ideas than I do and know better things. But can I tell you, if the stuff we keep doing to our bodies, we ain't going to never see 70. And so if we keep doing it, <laughs> I don't care what your mind thinks, your body's telling you it ain't about to make it. One person told me one time, I don't remember who it was, they said, uh, Carlos, you, you notice that you never see obese old people. You think about it. You go to a nursing home. You go to a, a senior facility. Most of those old people that are there, they're pretty small. You know why? Because all the obese people died earlier. You can check me if you want. The majority of the time you see old people cr crawling together in the mall or walking in the shopping, they're pretty small. They're not three, four hundred pounds. Why? Because the body has a way, time and, 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 and this, the, the, the society and the element we live in has a way to get rid of those that are not taking care of themselves. And that's a reality. That's a reality that I have to live with. Why am I bringing this to your attention? Because in your mind, sometimes you're fooling yourself. And you're living one way, and your body's saying, we are quickly fading away. And you're thinking, I got 10 more years. And your, body, and your doctor told you, you only got five. Help us, Holy Ghost. I'm trying to help you. you got, you're taking blood pressure medicines. You got diabetes. You got this going on, that going on. It's a sign from your body. Time is winding up. You better get your soul right. But folks say, well, I'm going to drink, I'm going to smoke. Yep, yeah, you just speeding up the process. That would have never made sense to me. There were certain things, even when I was back to the, I'm talking to you so straight. Certain things when I was back to the, I, I would not do. Because I knew it was going to speed up the process of my demise. 
People smoke weed, smoke this, smoke that. I said, no, friend, I need my lungs. I, I need them. I, I want them to function because I got to breathe. Now, it may not be better than a Twinkie, but at least I have some kind of idea of what's happening. And, and so we must understand some of us are speeding up the process. We're taking all kind of illicit drugs and we're, we're doing all this stuff to our bodies. And you, yeah, you may be 23, but your body's 57. And the problem is your body is telling you where you're at. Your body is telling you what's going on. And if your body is telling you some things, I'm just going to be plain honest. My wife is in the medical field. My majority of my family says some things are irreversible. So guess what? I'm not telling you that you should be afraid to die. I'm telling you if you die, you better be, you better be right with God. Oh, help us, Holy Ghost. I don't know why I'm talking this way. I just feel this in my spirit. I, there was a man that came to our high school the last week of before graduation. And this man was the, the husband of the choir director. Big guy. Deep voice, deeper than mine, just huge. And this guy walked up to the podium and he said, the party's over. That's how he said it. I'm like, my God, what in the world? I mean, we're supposed to be celebrating. we 17. You mean the party's over? The party just began. We're about to leave. He said, and then he began to tell us the things that we will come across in our adult life. And one of the things he said, he said, some of you will not see your 10-year reunion. And I'm sitting here. I'm like, who is that? We're young. Of course we're going to see 27. 10 years? Who, we hadn't lived yet. And I tell you, I buried two friends within that time. And other people that died that I knew of within that time. And that man was perfectly accurate because he had lived long enough to let us understand that youthfulness is not a guarantee for life. But I'm telling you today that whether your body's talking to you or the Lord is talking to you, you need to pay attention. In Ecclesiastes 3, verse 1, says this, it's written by Solomon, the wise king, it says to everything, everybody say to everything. everything, to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the, under the heaven. And then he goes to list the times and the seasons, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die and there's a time to plant and a time what he says he said not there is no eternity here there is a block of time for action some years ago when we first got married we realized that we only had a certain amount of time to have children so we decided to have kids during that time it was from this period to this period. And that was it. And after that, we we're going to go into the time of parenting those children. We had to make those decisions because we realized God didn't make my wife fertile for the entire time of her life. There was a time to have children. And then there was a time that children will not be had unless you call Sarah. And everything around us tells us the mind of God. The Bible says, David said, the earth declares his handiworks. 
You don't have to go far and you don't have to read the Bible necessarily to see the characteristics of God. That God puts everything in the earth with a finite time. You buy a car, I don't care if you buy a Bentley. That Bentley will go down eventually. You can buy Buckingham Palace. And I think I just heard it the other day that it had to make some, had to start making some renovations on Buckingham Palace. Why? It's gotten old. Anything man touches is automatically finite. Man does not have the ability to make anything infinite. Help us, Holy Ghost. And God made it that way. God purposely put us in a finite state. That's why when you die, they give you a birth date and they give you a death date. And the only thing they give you for the, the life that you live is a hyphen. And you can fuss and cuss and you can fight and you can struggle and you can do this. And all people know when they pass by your grave and pass by your tombstone is hyphen. That tells you your life is not that important to miss heaven. They don't give you a paragraph. They give you a statement. God help us, Holy Ghost. We must realize how insignificant this life is and how it's important that we're not preparing and trying to fight for this life, but we're preparing and fighting for the life to come. We just let's just be let's go down the road then some of us messed up this life pretty well let's be honest we just messed up this life just kind of it's a mess so let me ask you this how long are you going to be moaning the mess and not fix it in eternity you can sit here and say well i'm not going to get a mercedes I'm not going to get the big house. I'm not going to have this. I'm not going to have that. Or you can say, you know what? Let me prepare my mind for heaven. Let me prepare my soul for heaven. Let me prepare this and that, my, 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 my walk for heaven. See, because heaven is more important than this earth, you don't find Jesus spending a lot of time telling you how to become rich. Actually, the only time he talks about being rich, he says, how hard is it for a rich man to get to heaven? Oh. So here, let's, let's, let's put this in the right perspective. I'm striving to be rich. I want the nice this and nice that. God said, the more I strive to be rich, the, harder I, the further I am from heaven. My God. My God. I'm striving to Make money. And I, God says, the more you make, the harder it is for you to find your way to heaven. How about you find your, your way to heaven, and if God makes you rich, then God be glorified. I'm not saying you can't be rich and go to heaven, but what God said, somebody say what Jesus said. He said it's difficult. And you making it harder. It's difficult. Why? Because a rich person thinks his riches is his God. And thinks that his riches can get him out of anything. How in the world, let me just say this and I'm out. How in the world can Michael Jackson be so rich and can't find sleep? That tells me by itself riches can't buy you everything. I sleep good and I'm broke. Insomnia has never been my problem. And that's what God is saying. Sometimes we got to look at this thing called life and look at it through the eyes of God and stop looking at it through the eyes of the media and popular opinion. Solomon said there's a time for everything. 
in a season, a time for everything there is, a, and everything there is a season. What season are you in? What season are you in? Well, I'm not talking about, I'm asking what is God dealing with you? How is God dealing with you right now? What is God asking you to do? What is God trying to get out of your life? What is God trying to get your attention to? Because a lot of times we're paying attention to something God don't want us to pay attention to. God's trying to get you in, in the church and you're steadily trying to be, you know, uh, something else in somewhere else. God's telling you, well, you know, Jesus' name baptism is right. And you trying to be, you know, the next bishop of the next charismatic church. He said, you know, you need the Holy Ghost. And you're trying to figure out how you can circumvent speaking in tongues. How is that going to work? How are you going to go to a heaven where everybody else speaks in tongues? And you don't. I'd like you to show me that in your Bible. Show me one, one apostle, show me one New Testament saint that didn't speak in tongues. And I'll give it to you. Sometimes we're trying to do something that God does not, is not endorsing. And we're trying to tell God, I'm still going to make it to heaven. Here's, here's, where I, here's where I am. Here's why I'm here. I'm trying to tell you the truth. And I'm trying to get you back on the right way. I'm trying to show you what thus said the Lord in his word. Why? Because some of us are making up our own thing. And it, it doesn't work. And I'll tell you like I'm saying to you right now. I'm not going to lie over your casket. I have never put anybody in heaven in a funeral. Because they're dead. I don't know where they're at. I, I can tell you that if you got baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, you're on your way to heaven. That I can tell you. The, the part I can't, I can't say is, because I didn't live with you 20, that you live this life holy and consistent. So if I baptize you and I pray for you and you receive the Holy Ghost, there's a good chance you're going to heaven. Because that's required of God in his word. Now, I, if I baptize you and you got filled with the Holy Ghost and you live like hell outside these four walls, can't do nothing for you. Not going to lie. Now, I'll say they were part of this church, Brother John. I'll say they, they gave their tithes. I'll say they was on the willing to do committee. But how they live their life is between them and their God. How you, uh, that hyphen, what are you going to do with that hyphen? Please don't, you know, uh, let me move on. Here's what Hebrew 3 verse 6 says. That food sounding good even closer now, doesn't it? It says this. We're going to verse 7, verse 7. Wherefore? As the Holy Ghost said, today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works for 40 years. Everybody say 40 years. Wherefore I was grieved with that generation and said they do always hear in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. That's God. Somebody say, that's God. Here's God. He is, the Holy Ghost is talking about the 40 years that the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness. And here is God trying to get them into a land that he promised. And they tried tooth and nail 
to fight God the entire way. That's why we're doing that series of From Egypt to Canaan. I want you not to repeat on your journey what they did on their journey. They kept trying to go back to Egypt. They kept doubting God in the journey. They kept doing all kind of nonsense. And God said, don't be like them. Let God lead you. Let God direct you. Let his word order your steps. Let God be your God, be your Lord, be your master. Stop trying to find a place you've never been. You've never been to heaven. The only way you can learn to get there is through his word. And if you don't read his word, you will be... <laughs> Just, just last night, was trying to tell my mother-in-law how to get to my house. Just move. And she's like, well, just tell us. And, and we said, if I tell you, you will not find it. You need to have a GPS. She's like, well, I, can't use, I don't know how to use this. I said, well, you may not be want, wanting to come. That's how some of us are. Pastor, tell me how to find it. Unless you use the GPS, you won't make it. Because I can tell you all day, but you got to have the GPS for yourself. You won't make it. Now, I told her. You won't make it. That's how this, work, how this walk with God works. You're trying, I'm, uh, God help me. Let me just be plain honest. I've watched, I, I've been around church all my little life. And I've watched all kinds of Christians. I've watched Baptists. I've watched Methodists. I've seen Catholics. I've seen all kinds of people. And try to make up their own way. And try to do their own thing. And try to make it up as they go along. And it don't line up with the word of God. And they will not see heaven. Because they're using the wrong map. This ain't got nothing to do with the Pentecostals. This has got nothing to do with the label apostolic. This has to do with obedience to the word of the Lord. Sometimes when I went to New York just earlier this year, I don't like heights. I don't like heights at all. And I didn't know New York was like a series of islands. Somebody should have told me that before I started driving. Everywhere I wanted to go, there was a bridge to it. And it wasn't, bro, it wasn't like, you know, the Howard Franklin or the Courtney Campbell. I mean, these bridges was up there, and, and, I, and, the, and I'm like, my God. And I, and, I, and I don't see it. I didn't know it was coming. That probably that was probably the best thing because I had no choice. And turn the corner, I see, see something in the distance. And I'm like, oh, my God. Do I have to go over that? And so I'm there. And, and I'm just going to be honest with you. I tell everybody to be quiet. Just, no, don't joke. Don't laugh. Don't look at me. I don't, I don't even, if you're going to pray, pray in silence. <laughs> and my, my dear wife, she's just kind of stroking my hand. Baby, it's going to be okay. And I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, this is not the way I wanted to go. This is not the way. And there's no U-turn, there's nothing. Holy God. You got to understand that in this walk with God, there's some places you don't necessarily want to go. But you have to transverse that bridge. And you have to go over this mountain. And you got to go through this valley. And you got to go through these parts. I know it's not all the way fun. And I know it always, don't always look good. But if you want to get to heaven. If you want to see God's face in peace. If you want to go to glory. You're going to have to transverse these things. You're going to have to face these things. And let God lead you through these things. Somebody give God some praise. You gotta, 
You got to want to get to the end. You got to. You got to want to get to the end. It's not the journey. It's the end. You want to get to the end. You got to have heaven on your mind. You got to say, I want to go to heaven. I got to get to heaven. See, we want heaven in a nice package. And heaven did not come in a nice package. It came in a man named Christ Jesus. And the, oh, boy, and the entry door huh, had a lot of blood on it. Huh? It had a lot of blood. Huh? Because if you don't go through the blood, huh, you won't be washed. Huh? You won't be cleansed. Huh? You won't be purified. Old folks used to say, this is a bloody way. This is a bloody way. You can't, you can't get, get to heaven without going through the blood. Jesus said, this is my blood, the New Testament that's shed for you for the remission of sins. Peter comes across, Acts 2.38 said, be baptized every one of you for the remission of sins. That means that the blood is applied at baptism. Jesus said, my blood is for remission. And if baptism is for remission, that means the blood is applied at baptism. So without baptism, there is no remission of sins. People want to tell you, you can go to heaven without blood. That's the same thing Cain thought. Cain thought I come with some vegetables and I come with some tomato and I come with a salad that God will take it. And God said, no friend, uh, you got to understand uh, your sin uh, is like scarlet. Uh, and the only way you get remission uh, of your sins, uh, you got to have some blood. Uh, one prominent preacher say, well, I'm not going to call anybody sinners. Well, bless God. How are you going to know the condition of your soul? This is not a way to make you feel good. This is a way to get yourself right. And if Jesus, Jesus said, they, they, Jesus said that those people said, you're always around publicans and sinners. So how do preachers now say, I'm above Jesus and I don't call anybody sinners? The Bible says, David said about himself, I was born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We're born sinners. And the only way we can be saved is through the grace of God by faith, but by faith in the baptism of his name. So, here's the deal. I'm done. Jesus said to those folks, you know, this Jerusalem was good. It was there. It served its purpose for the time frame. But when I came to check on it, it no longer served its purpose. It was supposed to house the glory of God. And Brother Brandon can tell you that at the time of Jesus, there was no ark. There was no glory there. The glory had long been gone. Some scholars believe they would put, put a rock. There was a rock in the place where the ark used to be. They, the blood didn't mean anything anymore. There was no presence of God there. And when the presence of God came, they didn't know it was God. That's how far along they were. People are pray, preaching and, and talking against God. God, God, we don't want the Holy Ghost in our church. God says, well, if I'm not there, what do you have? I don't want your name in my church. So I call you God the Son, and I call you God the Father, and I call you God the Holy Ghost. But the Bible said, in everything you do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of Jesus. Jesus said, it was good. We had our time, but it's no longer useful because what I'm going to do, I'm going to take my presence and I'm going to put it in the people. I'm going to put it in their spirit, my spirit in their spirit. That's why Isaiah, Joel said, he said, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. That's why he told the woman that said, you say you should, we should go to Jerusalem. That's why Jesus can say, don't worry about where. 
Worry about how. You got to, if you're going to, God is looking for true worshipers. You know what that really meant, brother, brother Brandon? What it really meant was in Jerusalem, he didn't have enough true worshipers to keep Jerusalem there. There are places that have, that are edifices that have crosses and have all kind of titles and there is no presence. When you go to church, there should be a presence of God that you feel, that you, that, that you experience, that lets you know God is here. And if you don't feel that, I can tell you this. If everybody is worshiping and you don't feel anything, there's nothing wrong with God. Is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? Oh, he, he said, here's the requirements of me showing up. Where two or three are gathered, I'm going to be right there. Oh, help us. If you don't feel God, and you see people feeling God, then you need to cut, run, you need to not walk to the altar, you need to run to the altar and say, God, I need your visitation. I don't want... Oh, I need your visitation. I don't want to miss your visitation. I don't know. Because hear what God said. He said, friend, friend, if they would have known that time, if they would have recognized when they saw the blinded eyes open and they saw the deaf ears unstopped, that this was the Messiah that was promised to them hundreds of years ago by Isaiah, by Abraham, by Moses, then you would have had some peace. But because you didn't recognize it, I'm going to take my presence outside of this building. See, here's the thing, and I'm done. The reason why Jerusalem wasn't important to God anymore and why he couldn't just keep it up and keep the temple, because it would have become a relic. God don't deal in relics. What is a relic? A relic is something that it, 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 it represents what it used to be. If the temple would have stayed up, people would have been journeying to the temple thinking God is still there. And God said, no, I'm not going to have people come to a place where I no longer reside. You know what he said? I want you to show up in the upper room. I want you to wait there. <laughs> I'm not going to be at the temple. I'm going to be in the upper room with 120. And on the day of Pentecost, I'm going to come in that room. And I'm going to make you the temple. And I'm going to make you the temple. And that's why Paul said, beloved, now are we the temple of the Holy Ghost. We are not our own. God said, I don't need a temple any longer. I don't need a, a temple of bricks and, and mortar. I said, I got walking temples all over the place. I got them all over the all over the world. They're in India. They're in North America. They're in Africa. They're in Russia. They're all oh, help us. They're in Spain. They're in South America. I got temples all over. I said, I'm trying to make you a temple. Come on, let's stand. I'm trying to make you a temple. I don't want, I don't need relics. I don't need people that represent what used to be. Just a, just a, a statue. That used to be the presence of God. No, no, I said, I don't need that. 